the topic of today's lecture is gravitational waves, but maybe before we do it, I could talk a little bit about the homework. So just a second. Okay, so there was the problem sheet number four, and I wanted to discuss it a, a little bit. I think you got it right, Mr. Saji. Almost everybody got it right, with maybe two exceptions. Some people got one of the signs wrong. So you're supposed to calculate the Christoffels of the following metric, G equal to uh, one half, uh, G equals to D chi squared plus hyperbolic sine squared chi d phi squared. Uh, okay. Yeah. And then we were supposed to calculate the Christoffels, the Riemann, and the Ricci. So let's do it quickly. Uh, my favorite method of calculating the Christoffels is to use the Lagrangian and the derive the equations of motion of uh, or the equations for a geodesic. So I write the Lagrangian, which is basically the application of the metric here. Uh, phi dot squared and the Euler Lagrange equations. So the order of the coordinates is chi phi. This is let's say y one, this is y two. Uh, we first calculate the derivatives with respect to the dots of the Lagrangian, that's chi dot, uh, this one over here, d over phi dot, that's sine hyperbolic squared phi dot. Uh, we can calculate the derivative with respect to lambda of this thing over here. That's very easy. It's a bit harder with that one. D over d phi dot, that's sine h squared chi phi double dot uh, plus two sine h chi cos h chi. Uh, yeah, and the derivative of Uh, and the derivative of this will be cos h chi uh, and that's the derivative sign would be uh, okay here we got two sine h cos h and then the derivative of chi, chi dot, phi dot. Yeah, that's what it looks like. And then we also need the derivative with respect to chi itself, that's equal to uh, sine h chi, cos chi, only this one contributes, and there is no derivative with respect to phi. Uh, putting this together, uh, so d over d lambda dl over d chi squared minus dl over d chi cos zero, that's one Euler-Lagrange equation, and this will be chi double dot, minus hyperbolic sine hyperbolic uh, yeah there's phi dot squared here I forgot about that phi dot squared that's equal to zero and then the second Euler Lagrange equation with respect to phi that's Uh, hyperbolic sine squared phi double dot plus two 
sine h chi cos chi chi dot phi dot uh, and that's supposed to be equal to zero. Uh, just to clean up this last equation, we will divide everything by sum sine h squared chi. And from this one, we get phi double dot plus uh, two hyperbolic cotangent chi chi dot phi dot equals to zero because that will be cos cos divided by sine h so hyperbolic cotangent. Uh, that's let me write a little better. Uh, no, I want this one. Yeah. Okay, and now it's the question of reading of the Christoffel symbols. The only one that don't vanish is the one corresponding to this thing here. So gamma chi phi phi that's uh, minus sine h chi times cos chi that's one of them and the other one that's gamma chi chi phi and that's half of this thing over here, which is, or half of this thing over here, which is cotan H chi. Yeah. Okay, let's go to the next uh, blackboard. So we have gamma uh, one, two, two equal to minus sine h. So this is not that much of a difficult problem also because it mirrors basically the two sphere uh, we actually did on during one of the lectures before. Uh, this metric is just like the metrics of the sphere except that the sign has been um, substitute with a hyperbolic sign. So all these calculations mirror the calculations we did at that time, although they're not identical. There are sign differences we obtain because of that. Okay, and all other are equal to zero. Yeah. And it's also good to write down the inverse metric just for the sake of convenience. That's uh, the metric is diagonal. So all you need to do is just to invert this sine h squared over here. Okay. So here we have the Christoffels. Do you have any questions to the Christoffels? I don't hear any. Yeah. So then we have the second problem, the Riemann and the Ricci. Uh, so in dimension two, we have shown that there is only one independent Riemann component. This is basically Riemann one to one two equal to minus R one two one what two one one two and so on. And it's equal since the metric is diagonal and this term here is one, this is equal basically to one, R one, two, one, two. And then we can apply the formula for this thing over here. So that's the derivative with respect to the first variable one of one, two, two, minus the derivative of two gamma two, uh, one, two, one, plus, and here we have to contract two metrics. That will be gamma one a 
one gamma a uh, two two minus gamma one a two gamma a two one. Yes. Uh, here the summation is with respect to a equal to equal one and two. Uh, yeah, so obviously this guy over here is equal to zero simply because there is no gamma one to one non -vanishing. So gamma one to one coefficient is uh, Christopher symbol is equal to zero. Uh, here we have two possibilities, either gamma one, 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 two, two, but this is zero because there is no gamma one, 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 or gamma one, two, one, gamma two, 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 but this is also zero. So there is no contribution from here. Mm, and then here you could have gamma one, one, two, gamma one, two, one. But that cont doesn't contribute because you would have to, to, to have gamma one, one, two, which is equal to zero, or gamma one, two, two, gamma two, two, one. And this one actually does contribute. So out of that, all we get is minus gamma one, two, two, multiplied by gamma two, one, equals simply to this one over here. Okay, so the first one is basically D chi of this thing here, cos chi, uh, right? And here we get minus gamma, this one will give sine A chi, cos chi. multiplied by this cotton. Let's write it as cos chi divided by sine h chi. Okay, this will produce, this first thing will produce two terms. One will be the minus cos per chi. And the other one will be minus sine h square chi. And here we just get plus cos square chi. So yeah, we are left with just one minus one minus sine h square chi. That's the result. And that's the only relevant component of the Riemann. Any questions to this, to the derivation of the Riemann? It's straightforward application of the formula. There's nothing sophisticated here. Okay, and then uh, we move to the Ricci tensor. This is the Riemann. And this is the Ricci. Uh, yeah, so we have in principle three components, R11, which is R1, 1, 1, 1, 1 plus R2, 1, 2, 1, uh, which is, in other words, this is obviously zero because there's a repetition of the first of the of the in this pair of indices. So this is R two one two one G two two. Uh, and that's basically the same thing as R one two one two. So that's minus hyperbolic sine squared chi. And we multiply it by the inverse metric that's sine h to minus to squared, so this is minus one. R21, that's the second one, that's basically R1, two, one, one, plus R2, two, two, 
to one. So we are summing over the first and the third index. But here we have um, the repetition of the uh, one, one index. So this is zero and here uh, we basically need to uh, lower this index over here, but that's just multiplying by a coefficient and we get a repetition of the in the first two indices. So this is zero anyway. We are left with R22, which is R1212 plus R2222. Again, let me stress that this is zero. So that's zero, obviously, that's zero, that's zero, and that's zero. And this guy over here is just R1212 multiplied by G11. And that's equal to one over here. So that's this thing here is just the R1212 component of the Riemann, which is this thing here minus hyperbolic square sine. Yeah, so the R11 is equal to minus one, R21 is zero, R22 is minus sine square a, sine h square chi. In fact, we can summarize all of that in the following way. Uh, R A B is equal to basically minus the metric two A B. You can check this out. And the last thing is Dirichi scalar. Uh, that's R A B G A B, which is, we could do it component by component, but if you use this thing here, this is basically J G A B times G A B. Uh, and that's the trace of the metric, which is minus two. Uh, yeah, so it's pretty much, we get a very similar result as we did for a standard two sphere. Let's have a look at the uh, solution over here. Uh, if we substitute this, the standard sign uh, here instead of the hyperbolic sign, that will be the metric of a two sphere. But here we have the hyperbolic function. It turns out that the metric has fairly similar properties in the sense that we also get constant curv scalar curvature, but this constant is negative. This is, this is known as the hyperbolic space. Do you have any questions to this? Okay, if not, then we can go on with the lecture. Okay, let me share the screen. And the topic of today's lecture is gravitational waves. Mm. Let me start the annotations. Okay, you should be able to see the pointer. Uh, so let me re please recall that gravitational wave astronomy is a rec very recent, recently, uh, it's an emerging field of astronomy, which uh, started emerging quite recently. Gravitational waves are, set, are small distortions of space time propagating with the speed of light uh, through the space time. They were predicted first by general relativity and unlike all other predictions we were discussing so far, they have no simple Newtonian analog. They're st strictly a GR thing. They tend to be very difficult op to observe and it took a long time for the astronomers and physicists to learn. Excuse me, could you please mute the microphone? Somebody has the mic on. I may check who that might be. Uh, oh, thank you. Yeah, 
So and they tend to be very difficult to observe. Uh, the first observation, in fact, happened in, I think, 2015, not earlier than that. Uh, so around 100 years after they were predicted. Uh, the reason is that they put the, the passage of gravitational waves produces relatively small effects. We will talk about them today. Uh, and simply experimentally very difficult and requires a very clever technology and, and, and a very clever experimental setup uh, to be able to detect a gravitational wave. Uh, it also turns out that it's basically impossible to produce gravitational waves in any reasonable quantities in a lab. The gravitational waves are produced by uh, masses moving in, a, in an appropriate wave, and these have to be large masses. So we have to rely on astrophysical sources of gravitational waves. Uh, we cannot produce them ourselves. Uh, a typical sources are binary systems in the universe, uh, binary black holes or binary neutron stars or black hole neutron star systems. So systems in which we have a, an object of, of mass of a couple of solar masses up to hundreds of solar masses uh, together with another object with, with a comparable mass. Uh, they, form a close, they form a closed binary system. Uh, they tend to emit gravitational waves. And at some point they merge. During the merger phase, they emit very strong gravitational waves, which we can pick up. Another possible source are asymmetric neutron stars, so very compact and dense objects. Uh, very spherical, but still they may have some asymmetries, and these symmetries produce gravitational waves. And also we expect early stages of the evolution of the universe. We expect that some gravitational waves were present at that time. Okay. So the theory of gravitational waves was developed first by Einstein in 1916, and they, then later developed by uh, pretty much at the same time he was developing GR itself. Uh, and then later developed by Brinkman, Troutman, Isaacson, Eddington, and many, many others. Uh, there were a lot of controversies in the early years of GR, whether gravitational waves are a real thing, or maybe just a coordinate fluke or something else. Uh, but around the 60s, physicists um, came to conclusions that actually they do exist. They are inevitable in, in general relativity. Uh, Weber tried attempted first measurements in 1960s, but they were not uh, successful. Technology was not really, uh, was not developed well enough. The first indirect observations of gravitational waves came later when uh, Hals and Taylor started observing a double pulsar. So a situation when we have two pulsars orbiting on a very close orbit. Recall that pulsars are very dense stars which uh, undergo rotation and emit periodically either optical or, or radio waves, which we can pick up uh, on Earth. Uh, they tend to emit them in very regular uh, intervals. Uh, in this system, because of the irregularities of the uh, times of arrival of pulses, uh, astrophysicists managed to identify that this is a binary pulsar system, uh, identify the, calculate the orbital elements, and turns out that the uh, the system uh, was so close that it was emitting relatively strong gravitational waves and this way losing a lot of energy. The loss of energy then translates to uh, the orbits of, of, of these two pulsars shrinking and the period decreasing, and that was observed. The decrease of period was very much consistent with the gravitational wave emission. And that was the first indirect evidence of gravitational waves. In fact, uh, both astronomers were awarded a Nobel Prize for this discovery. Uh, direct observation of gravitational waves happened much later in 2015, so not, not that long ago. Uh, and the, the event was a binary black hole merger. And in 2023, so last year, the first direct observation of the stochastic background gravitational waves, so the hum of all, of all uh, astrophysical sources in the universe uh, forming a stochastic background, uh, it was observed by monitoring the times of arrival of, of pulses from many pulsars. And this was seen also as an important breakthrough. So th you can see that this is very much an emerging field of astronomy. Uh, 
in this lecture, I will just give you a brief introduction to the gravitational waves and their physics, uh, but the field itself uh, basically warrants another lecture. Uh, okay. Uh, any questions to this introduction? Okay, I don't hear any. So we will now, uh, I will now share my screen uh, and we'll do a blackboard lecture about the gravitational waves. So let's go to the next. Blackboard. Mm. So I plan to discuss the gravitational waves in the linear approximation. And this is, this makes sense because gravitational waves mostly propagate uh, in the in, in more or less flat space time. So recall that in this case, the trace reverse of the perturbation tensor satisfies the following equation. This is equal to minus 16 pg t mu nu, which we set to zero. So this is zero. The box operator recall is just eta mu nu d mu d nu which we can write as minus d0 squared plus d1 squared plus d2 squared plus d3 squared. Or if we reintroduce the speed of light explicitly, this is, this is what it looks like. It's the same box operator or wave operator you know from electromagnetic theory. Nothing, nothing new here. And already at that level, we can make a physical prediction. Note that uh, what appears here in d over dt is the speed of light. Speed of light or the speed of electromagnetic radiation. Uh, and you know from the elementary theory of the wave equation that all disturbances, uh, all waves described by this, by this equation propagate with the speed given by this coefficient here. And this coefficient here is the speed of light. So uh, the gravitational waves, if they exist, uh, will have to propagate exactly with the speed of light. And gravitational waves. Okay. So now let's now try to uh, describe a plane wave. Plane gravitational wave. Uh, one more important information. This equation holds in the, the Donder or Lorentz gauge in which the perturbation is supposed to satisfy this equation over here. So this is the Lorentz or the Donder gauge. Okay, uh, the reason why we first deal with, the, with a plane wave is that plane waves, as we know from the Fourier analysis, form, they are first relatively simple to describe, so there's just wave propagating in one direction, but they can also serve as building blocks of all other solutions. We can write down any other solution as a superposition of plane waves, and the wave equation here is linear, we can always use the superposition principle. So we are not losing much of generality this way. So let's assume that H mu nu has the form of some complex matrix, possibly D mu nu times E i k alpha x alpha. Uh, this is complex, but in practice, we just take the real part of that as our physical uh, H mu nu, it's just complexification in order to make uh, the wave equation a bit algebraically simpler. Uh, so the condition that box H is equal to zero, that very easily translates to the condition that uh, 
this k vector has to be null because from differentiation we get minus uh, k sigma k sigma so differentiating with respect to x alpha once gives us i k alpha then we differentiate once again uh, this gives some k beta and in the box operator these two things are contracted with the eta metric the flat metric recall that we use eta alpha beta for raising the flat metric for raising lowering indices in this setup not the physical one but this unphysical flat one so box times h mu is this thing here times b mu nu times e i k x and this is supposed to be zero at every point so it follows that k has to be a null vector again it shows that the wave vector is null so the, the disturbances propagate with the speed of light but we also have to impose the gauge condition so we have h mu nu nu equal to zero and if we substitute this over here it follows that i k nu from differentiating with respect to nu times b mu nu bar uh, e to i k alpha x alpha is equal to zero and it follows that b bar k mu nu k nu is equal to zero so this symmetric tensor b has to be orthogonal to the vector k okay still it is possible to satisfy both of these equations so it's possible to have a plane wave but in order to extract more physics from uh, from this type of solution we will make some a bit more uh, another gauge transformation or coordinate system adjustment we'll introduce something called the transverse traceless gauge Uh, so we have already specified the coordinate system uh, to a great degree by imposing the Lorentz or the Donder condition. It turned out that it's always possible. But there's still a bit of freedom we can use to adjust our coordinate system even better to the plane wave solution and impose additional uh, requirements. Uh, the requirements being that the trace of this of the of this trace reverse of h is equal to zero and that all zero components of h bar are also equal to zero that's in principle five additional requirements this is one equation and this is effectively four equations for different alphas uh, we still have a little bit of residual gauge freedom let's see if we can impose that that condition and i can already tell you that yes we can although it's not that obvious from the very very beginning so recall that uh, we can always uh, make that given a vector field psi alpha we can perform a gauge transformation in which the trace reverse of h transforms like psi mu nu minus psi mu nu plus psi sigma sigma eta mu nu uh, we assume that psi alpha is periodic in the same wave our plane wave is periodic with the same vector k alpha and in that case it's easy to check that our solution transforms into b bar mu nu e to i k alpha x alpha uh, minus i k mu psi mu 
e to i k alpha x alpha minus i k mu psi mu e to i k alpha x alpha plus uh, we differentiate with respect to x that this gives a, a, a prefactor of i k sigma and then this is uh, contract with, with the sigma itself. So this is I k sigma xi sigma eta mu nu e to I k alpha x alpha, which is equal to I k alpha x alpha B minus I k nu psi mu minus i k mu psi mu plus i k sigma psi sigma eta mu. And this will be our new b. So a gauge transform with, with this vector psi leads to the following transform of the B tensor. It changes into something like this. And the question is, uh, can we still impose this gauge condition? Uh, in order to, uh, we want to do two things, keep the, keep the Lorentz gauge to impose h mu mu equal to zero, h mu zero equals to zero. Uh, can we find which satisfies that? Okay, so let's begin with the Lorentz gauge. Mm. Uh, if you go, I think, two lectures back, uh, you can check that uh, under the Lorentz transformation, uh, under any gauge condition of this kind, uh, this type of divergence transforms like H mu minus box psi mu. Uh, but for psi in this form, with, with, with this thing being constant, and with this type of wave part over here, it automatically follows that box times psi alpha is equal to zero. So the divergence of H, of H bar does not change. If it was initially zero, because we imposed the Lorentz condition, after this gauge condition, it remains zero. So Lorentz condition is preserved. Just because of the assumption we have made regarding the form of Xi alpha. Now it's time to check whether we can satisfy these two conditions. Yeah. So I will do two simplifications. First of all, introduce A mu equals to um, minus i psi mu. It somehow simplifies the transformation law for b. Now we have b bar mu nu plus k mu a mu plus k mu a mu minus eta mu nu k 
a sigma a sigma, we have just absorbed this minus i into uh, the definition of, of, of the vector. Uh, and also assume that the propagation happens along the z axis. We can always rotate the coordinate system to make it happen. So we assume that chi mu has the form of omega zero zero omega. The propagation is along the third axis and the lowercase k mu lowered by the eta matrix is the eta matrix is minus the omega zero zero omega. That simplifies things a little bit. Uh, Okay, so first the traceless condition. So uh, let's take the trace of this equation over here. So we get B sigma sigma plus 2K sigma A sigma, and then this produces minus four, K sigma A sigma. We impose that this is equal to zero in order to make B traceless. This, this, in order to make this uh, gauge transform be traceless. Uh, and this simply means that we take a sigma a sigma equal to one half b sigma sigma. So if we make sure that this is satisfied, uh, the resulting b new gauge transform b will be traceless. Uh, that's the traceless condition. Now, we would also like to impose the condition that B0 alpha is equal to zero. Uh, and that seems to be four new conditions, whereas we have already, whereas we had four components of a, and we have already imposed one condition. We, are, we have only three left, but four more conditions. So it seems that this is an overdetermined system, but it turns out that it's not. Uh, and these equations are not entirely independent. So let's have a closer look at, at, at the situation over here. Uh, so let's begin with the A equal one, two components, B zero A. Uh, so K has no components in A, B direction. So this is, so the new, so B zero A transforms into B zero A. Uh, plus, okay, we can have a contribution if uh, we take the K zero and A, A components. Mm. And then there is no contribution from here because eta zero a is always zero. And this is supposed to be zero. So we get the condition that the two transverse components of the vector a need to be minus b bar zero a over k zero. Then we have the B0, 0 component. Mm. So B0, 0 transforms into B0, 0 plus 2K0. So there is a K0 component here, and there is an A0 component here. Uh, minus eta 0, 0 is minus 1, so there will be a plus here, and here we get k sigma a sigma uh, we can write it in the following way uh, k lower zero is minus omega so this is minus two omega a zero plus and now we take the product here. This is omega minus a zero plus 
I we right uh, and then okay let's use the the lower case a here uh, sorry I'm I'm sorry for the confusion uh, let's write it this way That's minus two a zero, and here we get plus a zero a three. I want to remain consistent with my notes, meaning that. I calculate the lower index components of the vector A. Mm, so this is B, B bar zero zero minus plus uh, omega. And this term cancels out with this one and we got minus a0 plus a3 and you want to set this to zero and then we get the zero free component uh, that's b03 plus k0 a plus k3 a0 and there is no zero free component from here so this is b03 plus k lower zero is minus omega so this is minus omega a3 plus omega a0. So this is b03 plus omega minus a3 plus a0, and we want this to be zero. Okay, so it seems that uh, yeah. Mm. But then this equation over here, if we write it in the appropriate way, that's basically omega a zero plus a three, that's gonna be half of the trace of B. So it seems that we have three different conditions for a0 and a3 and we cannot satisfy them simultaneously but in fact we can we are almost there because we have to remember that b bar zero alpha times k alpha this is zero we have assumed this because this follows from the lorentz gauge condition And if this is so, then this means that omega b zero zero plus b zero three is zero, or that b zero three is equal to minus b zero zero. Oh, so let's go back to the previous equations. Let's go back to the previous equations. And what we see is that this is 
minus b zero zero. But if that is the case, then this condition over here is actually the same condition as this one over here. So we don't have three independent components. Uh, the equation uh, imposing that b bar zero zero uh, is equal to zero is equivalent to imposing that b zero three is equal to zero. So these conditions are equivalent. Good, that means that we have only two uh, equations to satisfy. Let's write them down on the next step, on the next page. Only two equations to satisfy. Uh, these equations being b bar zero zero plus omega minus a zero plus a three. And the trace equation omega a zero plus a three. This has to be equal to half e sigma sigma. Okay, and it's possible to solve it. You can do it yourself. Uh, yeah. So we've got a0 and a3 in terms of b bar 0, 0 and trace of b. And we have the transverse components aa. So there's the equation for the transverse components over here. And then There are equations for A0 and A3 over here. So to sum up, it's possible to find Xi of this form over here, which keeps the Lorentz gauge. So the H bar mu nu nu after the, the gauge transform is still zero. And yet we managed to impose additional condition that H bar mu mu, this trace is equal to zero. And the all zero components of H bar are also equal to zero. And this is called the transverse traceless gauge and helps enormously with understanding how the waves operate. So we are now in the Lorentz transverse traceless. H. Uh, the perturbation is note one funny thing. Uh, so H in transverse traceless gauge is very often written with this TT over here. Uh, if we know that this is equal to zero, so the trace of TT is equal to zero, then taking taking the trace reverse makes no difference whatsoever because there is no trace. So this is in fact precisely equal to the standard matrix TT. There is no, no point of writing this over bar here because it changes nothing if we have imposed this gauge condition. So this is very nice. It means that uh, trace reversed metric perturbation is completely the same as the perturbation itself. Yeah. And we know that this perturbation TT mu nu is equal to B bar mu nu e to i k alpha x alpha with B alpha zero equal to zero, B bar alpha alpha equal to zero, 
B bar alpha beta K beta equal to zero and K being a null vector. So K sigma, K sigma equals to zero. This is our plate wave solution in the TT gauge uh, and in the Lorentz gauge. Okay, do you have any problems to trace transverse traceless gauge? Any questions? I can take one or two before we make the break. Okay, I don't hear any. In that case, let's do the break right now. Let's meet at 10.09. Yeah, that gives us 10 minutes. Thank you very much and see you in 10 minutes. Okay, good morning, everyone. It's already nine minutes past 10. We can begin the second part of our lecture. Uh, we were discussing plane gravitational waves. We imposed the Lorentz transverse tracers gauge uh, in which the plane wave solution takes this form over here uh, with a symmetric tensor B bar mu nu constant tensor times the wave uh, factor E to I K X. We know that this K has to be a null vector. But on top of that, B has to satisfy additional algebraic relations, namely the zero, all zero components need to be zero. The trace needs to be zero. B has to be orthogonal uh, to K. Uh, on top of that, since H is, a, is the, the, the tra transverse traceless perturbation is a symmetric mat matrix, we also need to have B mu nu equal to B bar mu mu. Okay, that already tells us a lot about the um, physics of a gravitational wave. Uh, so let's first think what kind of admissible tensors B we can have here. Mm, okay. So first of all, if we have this B mu nu, We know that all zero components, so zero alpha and alpha zero need to be zero. So there is already uh, seven zeros here. But on top of that, B has to be orthogonal to K and recall that our K, uh, we have assumed that the propagation happens along this third axis. So K has the form of omega zero, zero omega. It's easy to check that if this condition over here is satisfied and on top of that, this condition over here, also we have that B uh, alpha three is equal to zero. So from that we have B alpha three equal to zero. This is entirely equivalent, meaning that there is additional vanishing components all over here. And in fact, the only non-vanishing components are the transverse ones. So only B, A, B not vanishing. So we have only four possible non-vanishing components in the transverse directions. But again, they cannot be arbitrary. B as a matrix is uh, symmetric. So this has to be a symmetric two by two tensor. And also we have the traceless condition. So it's a traceless symmetric condition uh, tensor. So B, A, B, B, A, A equal to zero and B, A, B equals to B, B, A. Uh, it turns out that the space of all tensors satisfying these relations is two dimensional. There, there isn't that many of them just two, namely B bar mu nu has to be a combination of, let's say, B plus E plus mu nu plus B X E X mu nu, where the plus and X are the following tensors.
one, zero, zero, minus one. I will explain later where, where this notation comes from. And the other one is zero, one, one, zero. Yeah. So all admissible Bs uh, need to be a combination of these two uh, tensors E. It's all, from this we inferred that uh, there are two possible polarizations of a gravitational wave. It's not just one possibility. There is a two dimensional subspace, but only two dimensional one uh, spanned by these two tensors over here. Okay, another remark. So when you go back to the gauge transform over here, the one we have performed, the one over here, or equivalently the one over here, it turns out that you can write it a little bit differently. So. It will be important later. We can introduce the projection operator. To the transverse space. That's called P mu nu is equal to delta mu nu. Uh, plus, so let u mu be the vector one, zero, 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 and let, let's say, e mu be the vector of the direction of propagation. We introduce this operator over here. You can check that it projects any vector to the subspace uh, of the transverse vectors, two-dimensional subspace. It is a projection operator. And it turns out that the gauge transform can be understood in the following way, algebraically. We take this B, whatever it was initially, we project it to this transverse space. But we also need to subtract the trace to make it traceless. So this is done in the following way. Uh, let's say, let's write it this way, kappa lambda p kappa lambda minus p mu nu. Or yet equivalently, The alpha beta p mu nu. Uh, and there is one half here, yes. One half because we need to subtract half of the um, trace times p mu nu, which is the metric on this transverse space. It's just a, a, a different, more algebraic way to write this uh, transformation from a general b mu nu orthogonal to k to the one which is in transverse traceless gauge. I will not derive that, but this turns out to be true and kind of makes sense. We just project everything to the transverse space and then we subtract the trace to make the resulting transfer traceless. Okay. Uh, any questions? I can take a question now. I don't hear any. So the next topic is, so already we have shown already that there exist certain types of plane waves. So a kind of periodic perturbations traveling through the space time with the speed of light in various directions. It turns out that for each direction, there's two possibilities to, to, to choose from. Uh, we know what the perturbation looks like uh, in an appropriate gauge. But the next problem is, but how does it affect the space-time geometry? How does it affect the physics? In particular, how does it affect 
the equations of motion. So, uh, how does a gravitational wave affect motion the motion of free falling bodies okay so i assume that we have uh, bodies which in, were initially at rest so dx mu over d tau these are massive bodies uh, which in the unperturbed space-time are at rest. They, their four velocity is just one, zero, 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 zero. That's unperturbed. In order to calculate the, uh, we need to write down the geodesic equation in the most general situation. Here we get gamma mu alpha beta dx alpha dx d tau uh, dx beta d tau. And this is obviously a perturbation of the order of h. So we can plug in just the zero order dx mu over d lambda, the unperturbed one over here. So we get equivalently that dx mu over d tau squared. That's gamma mu zero zero. Okay, so we need to calculate the Christoffel symbols. Mm. Uh, we know that gamma mu alpha beta at the leading order is just one to flat matter g mu nu h t t uh, mu alpha beta plus h t t mu beta alpha minus h t t alpha beta mu. So let's calculate gamma mu zero zero. Uh, that's one half eta mu mu h t t mu zero zero plus h t t mu zero zero minus h t t zero zero mu okay but we know that in our gauge the zero components of h t t are always zero so this is zero right because we have imposed the in, in, in our gauge h mu zero is always zero so this guy is zero and consequently this is zero so nothing really changes when the gravitational wave passes uh, we have x i equal to constant x zero equals to tau and our particles keep do not do not move at all at, at the same order they appear to just keep their positions at every moment so it may seem at first sight that gravitational waves have no physics because they don't cause any motion of, and of, of particles which are initially at rest. But that's a little bit misleading. Uh, so it seems that the plane gravitational wave has no influence on motion of 
particles, massive particles, at least those which were initially addressed. But, and now let's do the following. Let's calculate the distance between these particles. So, I'm sorry. So imagine we have a number of particles with word, which word, with word lines which are which correspond to to entirely stationary solution. So x i equals to constant, and let's try to calculate the distance between them as it changes with time. Uh, and we calculate the physical distance. Uh, the physical distance is simply the integral, uh, let's say over the, this will be x and this will be t. Uh, this will be inter an integral over the x-axis, so the axis in the direction transverse to the uh, propagation uh, direction of our wave from some kind of zero, let's say we, we, we calculate the distance from a particle at zero to a particle at x equal to delta x. And we calculate basically uh, G X X component, the square root of that over dx. That's the physical distance along the x axis at a fixed time. That's the integral from zero to delta x square root of uh, eta x x equals to one plus h transverse traces x x over dx. Uh, now we can approximate this whole thing here simply as one plus one half h t t x x, uh, simply assuming that h t t uh, is very small. We have always assumed that h is small with respect to eta, so this should also hold. So we've got the integral of the square root of of one plus one half h t t x x over dx from zero to delta x. Uh, so we assume that this distance is much smaller than the wavelength of, of our wave. In this case, we can assume that hxx is roughly constant. So this is simply delta x, one plus one half h uh, xx. So let's write it as bxx. And here we will have some kind of trigonometric function, omega t, which comes from the wave part. We are taking the real part of, of that. So what happens is that the physical, even though in this gauge, in this coordinate system, we have chosen each particle has a constant, uh, has constant uh, coordinates, this does not mean that the distance between does not change because the metric is time dependent now. There, it has a time dependent oscillating factor here and this oscillating factor uh, affects the distance between neighboring particles. So even though it appears that there is no motion, uh, there is a change of distance between particles as the wave propagates. Uh, basically they get closer and further apart. So there is a physical effect. Oscillation of distance between neighboring particles. The fact that they are stationary doesn't change anything. The distance changes, oscillates anyway. Now, uh, this quantity over here, or this one over here, 
uh, is very often known as the strain. Uh, it gives you the fractional change or the fractional variation of distance between neighboring particles. As gravitational wave changes, uh, the distance undergo undergoes oscillations with amplitude proportional to itself. So the fractional, uh, so this fractional part uh, is known as the strain or wave strain of gravitational waves. Okay, so do you have any questions to this? Okay, I assume you do not. So let's have a look at the same situation from a different point of view. So we will now apply the gravitational deviation equation. So we have a fiducial null particle <clears throat> with some kind of four velocity u nu. And what we know is that a neighboring particle, uh, a vector giving the position of a neighboring particle satisfies the following equation. Alpha u beta psi nu equals to zero. Uh, we assume that this, so we will look at the situation from the point of view of the local inertia frame given by this particle U, uh, by this fiducial particle. So uh, in this case, U mu is just one zero zero zero. Uh, and this is just the standard, uh, all gamma coefficients vanish. So this is just the standard derivative of psi mu over the tau squared. Uh, local inertial frame. So we are looking at the situation in the local inertial frame or local inertial coordinate system. Mm, uh, minus Riemann mu zero zero mu psi mu equals to zero. So the question is now to calculate r mu zero zero beta. Uh, you can check that this is basically h bar mu beta zero zero minus h bar mu zero zero beta. That's basically the application of the linearized uh, mu beta minus h zero beta, and we're in the TT gauge, mu zero. Okay, here we have zero components of the metric, so this is all equal to zero. Because h zero mu is zero. So we are left with one half h t t mu mu zero zero, the second derivative. Sorry, mu beta. Okay. So now let's go back to this form of our wave. H T T mu nu is equal to B plus B plus mu nu plus B X B X mu nu E to I K alpha X alpha. Uh, 
and we do it at the point x i equal to zero. And in that case, you can easily check that this equation over here takes the following form. This is one half. Uh, B plus. Okay, so let's calculate the transverse components, the X component. This is in that case B plus. Sorry. Uh, this is the general solution, but we will first look at, at, at the solutions in which we have only one polarization present. So we begin with B plus polarization. How does a plane wave with the plus polarization affect the position of the neighboring particle if we are given some kind of preformed particle here. And there is a neighboring one over here. We, we ask what is the effective position here. We are not in the transverse traceless coordinates anymore. We look at, at this thing at the local inertial frame of this fiducial particle over here. And we take the plus polarization wave. In that case, the geodesic deviation equation takes the form of d squared x over d tau squared. That's one half B plus. You can check it yourself. Psi plus minus one over omega squared e to i omega t. And d squared psi y over d tau squared is equal to one half B plus psi y minus one over omega e to i omega t. Uh, it's easy to find an oscillating solution of this equation, namely psi x is equal to one plus one half oscillating factor b plus psi zero x plus some kind of higher order terms we neglect. And psi y is equal to one minus one half e to i omega t b plus psi zero, zero y. So there is, uh, you can see that the x component again oscillates around some kind of inducial value uh, with the appropriate frequency. Uh, and again, we can see the emergence of B plus, which gives the amplitude of the wave. Uh, for the X polarization, there is no real equation for zero and three, they are unaffected, but again, the X, Y uh, equations look the following. Uh, that's one half B X psi Y. And we can write it as D over D tau squared E to I omega T. And here we have one half B X psi y d over d tau squared e to i omega t. And again, we have oscillating solution. Uh, that's psi zero dot x plus one half bx psi zero y e i omega t. And psi y is psi zero x plus one half x psi zero x e to i omega t. Again, we've got oscillations around some kind of equilibrium point, but this time uh, we have the y component uh, at the x component and the x component at the y component. Okay, uh, do you have questions to this derivation? 
If not, then I will show you a bit of a picture. So here's the plus mode of oscillations. We've got our central particles with respect to which we describe the whole thing. It's stationary at the center. And we calculate using the geodesic division equation what is happening with a ring of particles at some fixed radius r. And what you can see is that it's being squeezed uh, and then stretched basically in, in the, uh, with the ellipse having the major and minor axis x and y. This is basically one oscillation period uh, corresponding to the wave propagation. So it begins from a circular one, then there's a bit of squeezing, a further squeezing, then this relaxes, then there is stretching and squeezing in the opposite direction and relaxes. And this way, our ring of particles will oscillate. This way, you can understand why it is known as the plus mode. In the plus mode, uh, the directions of, of oscillations, directions, the, the, the axis of the, of the ellipse, which, which results, uh, form a plus. And then in the X mode, it looks pretty much the same, except that the axis of our ellipse are tilted uh, in 45 degrees with respect to the previous one. So the X mode of polarization of a gravitational wave causes the same type of stretching and squeezing of our ring of particles, uh, but in directions which are at 45 degrees to our major axis X and Y. Do you have any questions? Okay, probably none. So let's go back to our derivations. Okay, that will be number 13. Now, what happens if we look at a, a bit of a different situation? So again, we have a fiducial particle with some kind of mass. We've got another neighboring particle also with the same mass. But we assume that there is a string connecting them. And we would like to ask about the equations of motion. So for our fiducial particle, this is fairly simple. We've got, uh, let's say, in the direction of x, mx1 double dot is equal to k. So let's assume that the string has, has kind of, uh, has a stationary length of L0 when no forces are present. And the, the, the force has the form of x2 minus x1 minus l0. And we may add also add a kind of dissipative term because of some kind of friction. Uh, for the second particle, we got the same thing, but with, uh, with the sign reversed. But in the presence of a gravitational wave, we will have this x r x zero zero x term present from the geodesic division equation. Uh, in other words, this is just one half h x x zero zero. times L0. So H is X, X is a perturbation. Uh, so we can use the unperturbed value for X2, which is uh, L0 over here. And now uh, if we subtract these two equations and define uh, delta L being X2 minus X1 minus L0, that's the variation of this of the length of the string. It's fairly easy to derive the equation for this quantity. It's m double l dot equal to minus two k delta l uh, minus new delta l dot. That's basically the equation for the motion of the string. But we will have a driving term because of the presence of the gravitational wave. So. If we have a gravitational wave, 
somehow propagating in this area, it will introduce a new driving term to our oscillator. So we have a harmonic oscillator, possibly a damped one, if we introduce this damping term as well. But there is a driving force. Oh, sorry, I forgot L0 here. Uh, there is a driving force uh, given by an appropriate component of the perturbation term, of the metric perturbation tensor. Uh, what is important here is that even if we initially have this whole setup, this oscillator is at rest, so delta L is equal to zero, and we have a train of waves of some kind of finite duration, which passes here for some time and leaves, this driving term will in general generate some motion here and deposit a little bit of energy in this uh, system. Uh, why does it matter? Well, it matters because it shows us that the gravitational waves carry some kind of energy. When passing near uh, an oscillator like that, uh, they will cause the motion of these two masses with respect to each other and deposit a little bit of energy into the system. Uh, the exact energy will depend on the matching between the uh, between the uh, frequency of the oscillator uh, and, and the frequency of the wavelength. If they match very well, there will be resonance and quite a lot of energy will be deposited, if not relatively little. But still, the, the, the conclusion stands, uh, a passing plane gravitational waves is able to deposit energy in systems like that. It means that it carries a little bit of energy. Uh, is this argument clear? Okay, I hope so. So the first, the first gravitational waves, uh, wave detectors operate exactly using this principle. Um, Weber considered frozen solid bodies, which were which were supposed to undergo oscillations uh, due to the passing of gravitational waves. Uh, it turns out that this is th this setup is not sensitive enough for uh, detecting gravitational waves, but still the physical principle is kind of understandable. If we have an elastic body which is able to oscillate, um, then uh, in the presence of this driving term, uh, it will begin to oscillate even if it is initially at rest. Okay. So we know that gravitational waves can carry energy. Another question is how much energy do they carry? And this will be the topic of my next, uh, this will be the next topic we will discuss. We'll talk about the energy flux of a plane wave. Uh, so we consider a plane wave of, of this kind with, with an amplitude H0, uh, H0, E plus is the polarization and cosine is here. Uh, can you see the, uh, can you see the pointer and the, uh, and the slides? Because I'm getting very weird messages from my Zoom. Can you see everything? Yes, yes. Okay, very well. I'm sorry for that. Okay, so I assume that this is a plus wave. This is a plus polarization of a gravitational wave with amplitude h zero and with with a cosine oscillating term. And we would like to know how much energy it carries per, let's say, square meter. So, what is the energy flux uh, and per some unit time? Now, it turns out that there is a fundamental problem with defining energy uh, density of a gravitational field. Uh, we will not talk much about this in this lecture, uh, but the problem is that this is, a, 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 this is an ill-defined problem and, and, and usually an ill-defined quantity if you want to provide a completely general expression for the energy in a gravitational field. This is true for a couple of reasons. One of them is that locally you can always get rid of the uh, gravitational field, at least in the vicinity of a given point. We have shown this uh, earlier in this lecture. You can go to the local inertia frame where, in a sense, the gravitational field disappears. So it's difficult to construct 
energy from, from something that can disappear. And there are some other problems. However, it turns out that for gravitational waves at this linear order, it is possible to derive an interesting and, and reasonable expression for the energy carried by wave or the energy flux. So at the perturbative level, there is the, fun, there is the formula for F uh, given in terms of the H0, which is a dimensionless quantity. The strain, I didn't mention that, but strain is a dimensionless quantity. It gives the fractional change of length uh, of objects when the gravitational wave passes. And so the order of 10 to minus 1 to 10 to minus something, a very small quantity. Uh, there is omega squared, the, the circular frequency divided by 32 pi g. Now, uh, if you read a little bit more about gravitational waves um, or any gravitational waves publication, you will notice that gravitational wave astronomers and physicists prefer to use the standard frequency rather than the circular frequency like people doing electromagnetism do. So things are usually expressed in terms of frequency f. Uh, uh, these two are simply related by rescaling by 2 pi. So omega is 2 pi f. And if you get rid of this 2 pi, this is the, this is the formula you get. Uh, how do you derive this formula? So I will not show the exact derivation. There's a very nice derivation in Schultz's uh, first course in relativity in chapter 9.4. And it's based exactly on the interaction of, gra of gravitational wave with harmonic oscillators the way I, I discussed before. Oh, there's something in the chat. Oh yes, you can, sorry. Uh, basically, we imagine that the gravitational wave passes um, uh, through a wall made of this type of harmonic oscillators. Uh, these oscillators get excited. They start to oscillate themselves with, with the same frequency. This way they create their own gravitational wave, which interacts with the incident wave, somehow reduces the amplitude of the wave. And now we have a balance between the reduction of the amplitude and the energy deposited in the oscillators. It's a differential one, but we can integrate that. And from this type of considerations, you can, you can really derive the uh, equation for the flux of a plane wave. This is a very nice, rather tricky method of deriving the flux equation, but, but it works. Uh, but there is a much nicer and more general uh, expression written, for example, in Carroll's uh, Space-Time and Geometry Introduction to GR in chapter seven. I will show you in very rough deep, a very rough outline how this is performed, because I think it's, it's very important from conceptual level to see how the derivation of this flux formula happens. Uh, there's something very important to learn from, from, from this derivation. So Carroll's derivation which is, I think, based more or less on much early papers by Isaacson, uh, works a bit differently. It's based on deriving a full effective stress energy tensor for gravitational wave, waves. It's given by the formula over here. So you take H in transfer stressless gauge, you take its first derivatives and sum the way over here, and then you perform the averaging over a volume, which is supposed to be large with respect to the wavelength. Uh, this way it becomes, it's not quite a local quantity, it's a almost local quantity, except that you have to average it over uh, a number of wavelengths. How do we derive this type of stress energy tensor? Well, let's begin by writing the vacuum Einstein equations, but up to the second order. So, so far we were dealing with, with the first order. So G was supposed to be equal to eta plus the first order perturbation. But imagine we are also interested in the second order perturbation, which reacts to the first order one. So G is eta plus H plus H1 plus H2. H2 is the, is the higher order of H. Uh, in this case, the Ricci tensor is the linearized Ricci R1, the one we have already derived a couple of lectures ago. But we'll also have to take into account the quadratic terms in expansion of the region. We haven't derived them. They're quite complicated. I don't think it makes much sense to derive them here. Basically, it's a quadratic expression in the perturb perturbative metric involving all quadratic terms. And now we impose the Einstein, vacuum Einstein equations, which is basically reach equal to zero. So 
at the leading order, we of course has to linearize to two times h equal to zero, which gives us the wave equations, which then we to which we impose the appropriate gauge condition and then derive the algebraic form of the plane wave as we did today. But at the second order, we get the following equation. The first order linearized Einstein equations of the linearized Ricci acting on, on the second order perturbations plus the quadratic Ricci R2 acting on H1, this is supposed to be equal to zero. Okay, that's just perturba perturbation theory. Uh, now let's imagine we are interested in this H2. We rewrite the second equation for H2 in the following way. We've got the linearized Ricci minus one half eta uh, trace of linearized Ricci equal to eight pi something. What well, this something is given by basically the second order, the quadratic Ricci acting on H1. Uh, that's just rewriting the first equation, but writing in a very suggestive way. Look, what you see on the left-hand side is basically the linearized Einstein tensor. So the linearized Einstein tensor acting on H2, the second order perturbation, uh, is not zero anymore. H2 does not feel the vacuum space-time. Instead, it feels some kind of contribution from the first order perturbation. And th there is a big, this is a big lesson. It tells you that gravity gravitates. Even though our metric is, uh, is a vacuum one, there is no st true stress energy tensor there. The second order term in the metric which corrects the first order one, somehow feels the gravity of the first order one. So the gravity itself gravitates. A gravitational wave, uh, the high order terms in the metric feel the, 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 the gravity of, of, the, of a gravitational wave present at the linear order. And this is exactly given by the equation here. The Einstein of acting on H to alpha beta is equal to eight pi times local stress energy tensor given by this expression over here. Okay, so it seems that this local T mu nu is a nice expression because it's local given in terms of, of, of the perturbation of, due to the gravitational wave. It's also conserved, you can check that. Uh, unfortunately, it's strongly gauge dependent. So depending on the gauge you choose, you will get completely different energy content of your gravitational wave and that's pretty bad. But we can perform exactly this averaging of this quantity over many wavelengths. We fix a volume much larger than, than the wavelengths for, for, for dimension one. And we perform the averaging of this tensor uh, over this volume. It turns out that this, uh, this procedure allows us to, first of all, simplify the expression very much. The, the original expression is in fact very ugly in terms of, of H2. But on top of that, it also makes the uh, expression gauge independent. However, it makes it also somewhat non-local. Nevertheless, in the end, in the, in the TT gauge, the resulting expression is relatively simple. It's the one over here. This is basically the stress energy tensor, this second order metric feels when there is a gravitational wave passing. So it's, we can treat it as some kind of uh, energy content of the gravitational wave uh, measured by the gravity gra by the way the, the the gravitational wave interacts with with, with the space time and now we, if we take the zero z component so the component uh, of uh, so basically the flux of the zero component which is energy in, in the direction z which is the propagation direction it's easy to check that the resulting f is exactly the same so the flux is simply one component of the of this effective stress energy tensor. If you're curious and you want to see the exact derivation, it's it's algebraically quite involved. Uh, it's in Carroll's textbook. What is important is that there is an expression for the energy flux of a gravitational wave and you can derive it. Okay, do you have any questions to this effective stress energy tensor and the energy flux formula? Okay, I don't see any, uh, and it's already 10.58. I don't think it makes sense too much to start the next topic. During the next lecture, we'll talk about generating gravitational waves. So, so far we, we just had plane waves or superposition of plane waves passing through the space time, but we did not discuss where they may come from. Uh, during the next lecture, we'll consider a, a source, a, a region with not vanishing stress energy tensor, a variable stress energy tensor, 
and we'll see what kind of gravitational wave this thing is able to produce. Uh, That's also a bit of a lengthy calculation. Um, as you noticed, gravitational waves is a fascinating topic, but also quite algebraically involved, and most of derivations are relatively long and take some time to, uh, to adjust. We'll derive a fundamental formula called the quadrupole formula for gravitational waves uh, during the next lecture. Okay, let me remind you that we do not have a lecture uh, next week on January 16th. We meet on January the 23rd. Thank you very much and see you in two weeks.